She thumps a cane and drinks champagne She's formidable and judgmental But we can guarantee That she's a quintessential lady D But recognizes great potential What would them we do? This episode is brought to you by Kensington's newest title from Carolyn Sparks, The Siren in the Deep Blue Sea. New York Times and USA Today bestselling author Carolyn Sparks mixes romance, humor, and high fantasy in her latest series, Embraced by Magic. Book two, The Siren in the Deep Blue Sea, features duplicitous elves, shape-shifting dragons, and the powerful, strong heroines that you have come to expect from a Carolyn Sparks novel. The titular siren is Maeve, who has just discovered a unique ability, and she only wants to tell one person. But Brody hasn't been seen for two months. When Maeve mounts a rescue, she has no idea she's about to face down a sea witch, a curse, and an unimaginable tempest. You can find The Siren in the Deep Blue Sea by Carolyn Sparks wherever books are sold, and we do recommend buying from your local independent bookstore. Find out more at kensingtonbooks.com. Welcome to What Would Danbury Do, your guide to Julia Quinn's Bridgerton series from A to V. Have you ever wondered what was in those letters Simon Hastings' father left him? Neither have we, but apparently there's a whole second epilogue about Simon finally reading them, 17 years into his marriage with Daphne Hastings, nee Bridgerton. Join us as we audition new vocabulary, test the limits of Adele's memory, and generally just ask, what the Featherington is the point of a second epilogue? Don't forget you can find us on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook and join the conversation using the hashtag WWDDpod. I so deeply resented having to read epilogues. Like not just epilogues, <laughs> but second epilogues that were done <sighs> so much later than the actual books. Like I resent epilogues on a daily basis, but this was a lot. When I was working as an editor, I would regularly just red pen prologues and epilogues. Like my life depended on it. If you can't put it in the original story, then it doesn't have a spot in your story is the way that I generally feel. So the idea of second epilogues just makes my skin crawl. And because like her writing has evolved so much. Like yeah. this, this epilogue does not match the Duke and I. Because I know that there's an ebook version where you can get everything <laughs> like the first book, including the second epilogue. And like, it's not a cohesive work. Her writing style changes from the first book to the eighth book. But like this... <laughs> but then that's the thing like to be really jaded she wrote this as a marketing exercise this wasn't you know the full intent of what she originally wrote it was to give like a another little bonus bit to reissue books with nice with different covers probably um i did okay one of the things that i did like about the story mm. I mean I still I will go to my grave denying that this needed to happen at all <laughs> but since it did happen and we are professionals and we are here for the Bridgertons and we will go all the way in for everybody who's listening we are willing to do that for you so that you don't I have to so that you don't have to <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hate Simon's journey through this I didn't hate that you know eventually those letters had such little power in his life and thus his father had such little power in his life and that he really had completely embodied what Daphne had suggested to him in the first place which was the best way to get revenge on your father is to make him not matter and these letters sort of sitting there that and, I, and it was such a human thing. Like, yeah, my father doesn't matter and I've made this happy life and I'm really happy. But, you know, I still think about those letters. There's still some small part of me that's still a small boy that desperately wants my father's approval. So I'm not going to get rid of the letters. They're just going to sit there for a while until it's the right time. I thought that was a beautifully human thing of Simon. Mm. 
and I liked that, you know, eventually he did decide to open the letters and that he was okay. And I also have the feeling that regardless of what he was going to find in those letters, Simon was still going to be okay. So the fact that it turned out to just be pastoral details, what was in the letters didn't matter. How Simon felt about the letters, the letters he was going to be, you know, on an even keel regardless. So I did, I did like that about this little vignette. Adele? Yep. Thoughts and feelings. Oh, I thought I was making a noise. I shouldn't. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, sound like such a monster. I, <laughs> <laughs> I love that Simon, who grew up with no family, is at a place where he can hang shit on his daughters, fully appreciate, and that he also would do this for his brother-in-law's child. Like Daphne said, it was, it was his family's need that drove him to do this. Maybe he would have done this. 10 years down the track. I love that the, the letters were incredibly boring because his dad sounded incredibly boring and repetitive too. I also am 110% here for seeing Colin as an uncle because like when he was like, you and you, where's the other you? Like, you know, I just, I just thought that was adorable. Of course, Colin would be an amazing uncle. Of course. I guess I'm just really like underwhelmed that of all the many aspects of Daphne and Simon's future, the thing that we get is about the letters, which, like, I I mean, I do take your point, Kate. Like, I, I but I, I also am like, I could have, I could have inferred all of that from him choosing not to read them in the first place. I was yeah. really, <laughs> I was like, yep, there you go. I have to say, as the person in this conversation who has children and also uh, very recently turned 41 that getting pregnant right now is my absolute <laughs> worst nightmare and I'm <laughs> Daphne's like oh I'm just gonna like pretend it's not happening for a while and I'm like yes Daphne I am here for that content I understand completely this is like 250 years in the future and it doesn't matter that is 100% relatable but like uh. The fact that this is oh, just the fact that it is yet another pregnancy story mm. for Daphne and Simon, I felt like that was very pointed because by the time this came out, that like the discussion around the way that Daphne coerced Simon, like that that was very much in the zeitgeist. Have I used that word properly? I heard yes. other people yeah. use it like three times today and I was like, I'm going to find a way to use it oh, myself. God. Once I <laughs> once I knew that word, I use it all the time. It's a great word. It's just really fun to say. It's and it's sounds... super German sounding as well. <laughs> I was going to say, like, because it sounds like I know other languages, mm. which I mostly don't. <laughs> anyway, uh, the idea of another Daphne is pregnant unexpectedly story. Yeah, it just it felt very pointed. And, and uh, how Simon is so delighted. Immediately. Immediately delighted. Also um, pointed and not so delighted is all the discussions of fat, puffy, huge, like all the discussions of a pregnant lady. I'm like, this is... This is like a lot, it and it's not that funny. Also, it's baby. <laughs> yeah, like uh, women's I did, bodies I did do what like needs to happen. Daphne, I did like that Daphne confessed she didn't particularly like being pregnant because I think more people need to say that. Not everyone glows and feels great and loves being pregnant, and like I like to hear that different point of view. But I also didn't love hearing like Lucy on her ninth child is like radiant and slim ankled and. You that know, was... just popping them out one after the other. Is that the name wrong again? No, 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 no. you got it right. Um, when it comes to sort of this fat phobic content, there was a point where, like, Daphne's got her head hanging in a chamber pot and she's like, oh, well, at least throwing up keeps me slim. And I'm like, that is not a plus side. That is an eating disorder, my friend. That is not okay. <laughs> 
That's such a doubt. Because I was about to point out something really like frivolous. (laughs) (laughs) Um, All all I was going to say is that I'm fairly sure it's a little Easter egg in there that Lucy looking like she's 14 months pregnant is a um, kind of a wink to the fact that we know that she's about to have twins. And like, because doesn't she, she has twins Uh, as like her last. Right at the end. Yeah. So this is, that's why she looks like she's 14 months pregnant and about to No, but isn't Lucy only pregnant? I think Lucy's only on her fourth pregnancy at this point. Oh. And we know that she's got like We have to leave her alone. Jesus. I did quite like um, Daphne's interactions with Belinda because you could see, you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Um, or the or the violet either, um, and that you know she has a, a horrible name. Like what were they doing to her? That's so unfair. Belinda Bassett. <sighs> anyway, oh, um, so this is baby number five. So do we think that she'll call it Eloise after her sister, or like Elizabeth, well, or do we think it'd be a boy, like Edward after their dad, maybe? I mean, it's definitely going to be an E name because mm. apparently Daphne's real into that. Um, <laughs> she decided to follow her, like, parents. I don't know. Lucy was currently 14 months pregnant with her fifth child. So uh, maybe the 14 months pregnant is a little Easter egg that Lucy's going to end up with 14 freaking kids. <laughs> oh, Lucy, she doesn't deserve that. Mm-mm. She really doesn't. When I mean, she's Edgar. really got 15, because she's got Gregory as well. <laughs> Edgar. <laughs> Enid? Edith. Edith is cute. Evan. Oh, uh, I dated a guy Evan, named Evan. Evan. I do like that we finally have Bridgerton cousins that that know mm. each other and interact and seem to be friendly. But yeah. Um I don't know. I just like Queen would have could write Bridgertons for the rest of her life. I would actually really like it if she wrote the Bridgerton progeny books. I mean, I I don't dislike the sort of the ancestral Bridgertons, um, but I you know I'd like her to sort of moved into Victorian and follow Amelia and Belinda. I you know I'd be interested. I'd be down for that. If she just did one from each um, Bridget like Bridgerton sibling, she just so you got to know where they were all at and you had the supporting characters and still have a good story that lived lived by itself. Move through the Victorian into the Edwardian. You know, it could be really fun. I don't know what those things mean. Oh, it's just the different times of... No, I know they're different time periods. I just, I don't know what they mean. Are they all like 10 year periods? No, the Victorian period lasted forever. It's monarchs, right? Like the... It's the it's rain, reigning monarch, yeah. right? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, so I do know what it means. I was Queen Victoria stupid. was sorry. Queen, or, queen. Sorry, <laughs> Victoria was queen for a very long time. Kate, you would know this. What do you call it when, like, when Queen Mary was like in charge and stuff? What's that called? Which, wh- which I don't know. Queen one Mary? of them, but like Edwardian is easy because it's like. Uh, Edward, yeah. you know what I mean like like what do you call it when when Mary is in charge this sounds like the setup to a joke but it's not it does and I'm like I'm trying to remember when a Queen Mary was in charge oh are you talking about Bloody Mary before Elizabeth I don't well like yeah is, isn't that I don't think she has a name actually I don't think that there's a Mary time and then uh, El- does she get kind of folded into like Elizabethan or the Tudors because yeah. of her father. Everything yeah, I maybe. know about that is from Rain and the White Princess telly movie series. Mm. This it. is <laughs> completely off topic. But I've I've been watching through Wolf Hall with Kieran. I can't imagine Kieran watching that for some reason. Kieran loves history. But the weird thing is he he's been such a computer nerd his whole life that he didn't ever like he never took history courses in high school. He didn't go to university. He started a business out of university or out of high school. So he's never really had the chance to like learn those 
things. So we're watching through Wolf Hall, which follows King Henry's advisor, Thomas Cromwell. But the whole first part of Wolf Hall follows Henry VIII's affair and then eventual marriage and then eventual beheading of Anne Boleyn. And Kieran knows nothing of this story. Like, <gasps> absolutely Spoiler nothing. alert! <laughs> so he has no idea what's going to happen at any given moment. So oh, he that's keeps, great. It, well, it's, <laughs> it, was, it was shocking to me that he had no idea what was going to happen to Anne Boleyn. But then it just became really fun because he was shocked every time anything happened. And of course, that story is so steep in you know, white Anglo culture, and it's been told and retold so many times mm-hmm. that everybody knows what happens to Anne Boleyn, but he had no idea. So it was it was a true joy to watch through and him be shocked every time anybody died or anything happened or anything. He was just, the whole thing was, uh, was a surprise to him. Oh, it was really wow. great. It reminds me of um, when the Lizzie Bennet Diaries Transmedia Project came out a couple, like many years ago, watching teenagers get to know Lizzie and her family and then Darcy doesn't get introduced until like in the 60 or 70 episodes and they're all trying to guess what ha- is going to happen and then like Lydia is uh, translated into a sex tape that might go live because uh, Wickham was a real douche and like a website that was about to go live and they all crash they tried to hack the site to save Lydia but like they never knew what was going to happen because they didn't know Pride and Prejudice all these teenagers and they were constantly surprised by what was going on. And I just, it was so delightful to see something you love through fresh eyes for the first time when they also love it. Because, I mean, I've shown my niece some stuff that I loved as a kid. Like, it doesn't hold up for them. <laughs> so it's um, really devastating. With, oh, we haven't really talked about, like, you kind of alluded, Adele, you kind of alluded to the fact that Simon read the letters in order to help his nephew, uh, well, his family, but particularly his nephew. We kind of never explained what that was about. I'd read that epilogue before, but when I was re- rereading, I'm like, couldn't remember if there was a resolution to that or not. And then I'm like, no resolution. Although I do love that they're all pretty convinced he's reading and he's like, two and a half or whatever <laughs> yeah he's not um, i love yet. i love that penelope and, and colin's children are all like prodigies because of course they are <laughs> but yeah no no resolution there so george can't talk yet and he's yeah almost three which of course is part of the simon's problem or was the one of the issues that simon had growing up although simon of course had an abusive father but the I don't know, the solution to just treat him like you would any other son and love him is, I mean, it schmaltzy to the extreme, to the extreme. I just want to be very clear as to the extreme of the schmaltz that came out of that. But it's, I mean, it's good advice, nonetheless. But it's also, I wanted to be like, I guess very likely that one nursemaid who was really helpful yeah. in Simon's development, like... She's probably not alive anymore. But, like, can't... I just wanted them to track someone helpful down. Like, there are things that you can do around, like, speech therapy and, yeah, there are there are games and, and exercises that you can do. And I wanted them to find <laughs> someone who was capable of imparting was, that knowledge. Was- <laughs> like a, a eight a Help 19th, a child, damn it. <laughs> it was like a nineteenth century per, uh, doctor with weird ideas. Exactly. That's what Simon's nursemaid was, wasn't she? Some like like seventeenth century I don't know. Nursemaid, yeah. Nursemaid Nanny. with weird ideas. Like I just wanted someone <laughs> to be like, what if we try and sing with him? Because actually, that's um, there are a lot of people who have speech impediments, in particular stutters, who have found that singing is a really great way to help themselves. Like, yeah, because you're a different part of the brain diff- than you exactly. would be just speaking. Yeah, I say exactly um, like I, I know why. It- I just know that it is a thing. <laughs> I did do some child psychology because I was a trained teacher. So that was part of my 
um, oh. university during. Mm, all forgotten now. Uh, I wonder, because we do love, you know, she, Quinn loves some symmetry and some mirroring. Mm. Um, if George is supposed to mirror Penelope's secretive nature, maybe he's writing a gossip column. <laughs> preschool it's like tales or from the, the nursery children that, that, that's a good run <laughs> if you don't talk you'll never get caught <laughs> oh he yeah. sounds like a nice kid though so it was kind of delightful two and a half year olds do not have that nice baby smell anymore two and a half year olds always smell <laughs> sticky regardless of how clean they are true Sorry, I'm still hung up on the idea of being pregnant again, and it's just, it's a lot. I'm, I'm very deep in my feelings about this. I Well, look, I was deeply concerned for her <laughs> when it turned out that she was she was about to be pregnant at 41. I was like, oh, honey, this is not a good era to be going through. A, like, no. Do you want to know what they call women who get, or pregnancies for I women who are older? Know. Who are older than 35? Geriatric. Geriatric pregnancies. <laughs> I know, because I nearly said this is not a good era to go through a geriatric pregnancy. And then I was like, oh, don't pretend like you know things, Rudy. <laughs> <laughs> Those are not good words means to have I'm together. a geriatric. Uh, well, when I had my second kid, I was a geriatric pregnancy. And I just nearly hit everybody who said that to me. <laughs> oh, actually... <laughs> I still don't think that this, I don't know, uh, that this epilogue, because it's not even a novella. I no. don't think that it's worth reading at all. But I did laugh about the um, about Simon calling Daphne a poor duck and then was like, oh, no, that's right. I'm going to step back from the bed because there was that one time that I called her <laughs> a radiant duck <laughs> and she hated it. <laughs> <laughs> she she or was pregnant like the and the fact that she she thinks she's stoic and they all like he tried to convince her that she was and it just didn't play stoic <laughs> people don't walk funny. around talking about how stoic they are no no i'm no no i'm fine <laughs> yeah it's it's completely unnecessary but some people really do like an epilogue and really do like an epilogue baby and like that there's but, uh, a happily ever after. Yeah, I mean, the baby epilogue is so deeply entrenched in romance. It's, mm -hmm. I mean, it goes beyond cliche to whatever a word for beyond cliche would be. Uh, the thing is, Daphne still doesn't strike me much. And I think this is almost like one of the worst versions of her in this epilogue as well. So, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, well, I mean, that's exactly right. It's completely unnecessary. These are 100% unnecessary, but, you know, it was a nice little vignette. It mm. did something it nice with Simon. a lot of in there. Yeah. I will, I will say that, like, Quinn is very good at getting good, like, character numbers to play direct. Like, she's, I mean, there was, like, three storylines in that. Mm. That's pretty good. In principle, pointless, but in execution, grudgingly enjoyable. <laughs> Shall we do? Because I I really enjoy talking about the what the Featheringtons. Can we do them for these? Are you guys? Did you guys yeah, yeah. think of any? Because I highlighted some yeah, exactly. stuff. Oh well, for me though, what the Featherington was definitely her hanging out of the chamber pot, being all like, at least throwing up keeps me slim, and I was like. It's an, yeah, that was deeply what the Featherington for me. So one that I highlighted is not actually about Simon and Daphne. It's about Colin and Penelope. Colin and Penelope did not own a home in town and to economize, they tended to stay with either Daphne or their oldest brother, Anthony, who had inherited the title and all that went with it. And I just want to ask... Are they suddenly poor? I mean, I understand if they're staying with their family for, like, family time. 
but it's because they're economizing and I want to know why because Kate did the His math wild that one time. <laughs> career went fucked. <laughs> well, I mean, he's the third son, right? So even if Anthony yeah. has given him a reasonably good living and Penelope would have come with a reasonable dowry. And um, all of her whistled in money. Oh, and yeah, then also the money that they both make as authors. Uh, yeah, they wouldn't be making a lot of money as authors. What uh, what I was surprised by is that they didn't just live in London full time. Like, where else are they going to mm. live? They don't have any ties outside of... I think maybe that's more my point. Like, I don't understand where they're living. And I don't Unless understand why they're... Yeah. They're living out in York... Was it York that Eloise moved to? Unless Lock they moved it that way to right. <laughs> so lovers <laughs> be, would not be separated. Yes, to be close to Eloise and, and Benedict in theory, but in reality it's because Penelope and Eloise need to continue their very close intimate relationship. Just gals being pals. <laughs> Also, um, people wouldn't know, still wouldn't know that Penelope was whistled down. That's a secret. So, what do they do with all that money? No, that no, know. she announced it at the ball. Remember? Yeah. Oh, shit. God is gone. <laughs> my memory is really. T- this podcast is proof that my memory is fucking awful. Like, really, Jesus <laughs> Louise's. I mean, one of the um, one of the reasons uh, that they announced who she was at the ball. Aside from claiming her success and that being very yeah. important to her, like to her personal yeah. arc, <laughs> I'm sure also had to do with the fact that like it'd be nice if she could access her own money. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, it makes no sense unless they both got gambling issues. Hmm. Maybe uh, that is what hmm. we're going to learn in their second epilogue. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Adele, weirdest part. What the fuckery? What are we, yeah. Simon sees George with um, what he hopes is chocolate around his mouth. I'm like, if you think he's putting shit in his mouth, wouldn't you go up and stop him? Anyway, moving on. That was a WTF. <laughs> um, I don't know if Kate has a story about this, but I have two stories about this of, like, little kids, like, about that age, like, around two-ish. Like, they just, they, look, I had my old boss one time and was like, I feel really bad, but our daughter has taken her nappy off and just smeared shit everywhere. (laughs) And I was like, I am so sorry, but I can't deal with this. (laughs) He went to work and his wife had to, but a friend of mine, her, her two-year-old did the exact same thing. Just like she had, she was quietly playing for a little too long. And then my friend went into the room to be like, I wonder why she's so quiet. Cause she had taken her nappy off and just smeared shit everywhere. <laughs> Like they they go through a phase. Luckily, I do not have any firsthand stories about that. So (laughs) I was watching your faces. I was telling those stories and being like, "Oh, Kate has never had this." (laughs) Nope. No. I don't think my nieces did that either. Actually, thankfully. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, Throwing up. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's time for. What would Damry do? This is when we imagine that a character from another favourite book has written to our favourite terror of the ton, Lady Danbury, to ask for some advice. So today we have a letter from Rosie Gonzalez from Zeta Polanka's Crush Interrupted. Lady Danbury, my life is in shambles. I'm a writer, but I've lost my drive and a whole contract. I mean, it's not dire yet. I've got a little money for some breathing space, but I'm worried. What would Danbury do? I don't think that Lady Danbury would have any time for that. She would be like, you've got some money, you've got some time. Stop wasting it. Do what you have to do. Just pick yourself up, dust yourself off and take advantage. 
And if in your fictional world it's a COVID safe environment, I'd go fucking anywhere else for a holiday. (laughs) (laughs) Just putting it out there. (laughs) I agree. Actually, that's a really good thing. If you have a little bit of time and a little bit of space and you're picking yourself up and dusting yourself off, then get yourself out of your routine. Go somewhere else. Some place that doesn't look like where you're coming from. And, you know, reinvent yourself. Figure out who it is that you are and what you want. It's almost like you guys have read this book. (laughs) Oh, my God. Much like the Duke and I, this is a sibling's best friend romance. Oh, my favorite trope. I I love love, that trope. I love sibling's best friends. And so what Rosie does is her... Her best friend, Carrie, has decided to go on a bit of an impromptu trip to Europe. Remember when we were allowed to leave the country we were in and go to a different country? Remember when you were allowed to go to an outside? (laughs) Do you remember when you were able to leave your apartment? Which Kate and I... Stage four bastards right now. Like, Jesus. God, it's so bleak. Like, just. It is. um, (laughs) Although, in in positive silver lining COVID news, I 100. No, fuck off. (laughs) (laughs) Nobody's having sex right now. Everyone's too depressed. (laughs) There's not going to be a COVID boom. Yeah, no, really. You know what the best, the best thing for long, happy marriages are? Space from each other. <laughs> I was about to say, like, maybe not having your parents live with you for a oh, while. Oh, I mean, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I ordered, I ordered myself some Shit's Creek inspired face masks. So I have one that says, if David. <laughs> and I have, and I have another one that says, love that journey for me. So <laughs> it's the small things that get you through nah. stage four. <laughs> Whatever gives you the giggles. <laughs> well, so what Rosie does is she decides to house sit for, or apartment sit for her friend who has, um, who has taken off and um, kind of accidentally ends up having like a bit of an overlap in the in the apartment sitting sort of situation with Carrie's brother. He he has mm-hmm. decided that he also is going to stay at the at the fancy apartment and so suddenly they're there at the same time and um yeah so this this guy, her best friend's brother, who she's always had a crush on, is like suddenly right there in her space while she's trying to like get her creative groove back. So Hey, hey. <laughs> anyway, <Get her> so <laughs> creative juices flowing. So that's one for. <laughs> so, I guess to kind of sum up, the main reason I chose Crush Interrupted is because it's a low conflict novella. And honestly, I think we all deserve something short and sweet and with siblings' best friend trope. That's all for this episode of What Would Danbury Do? We'll be back in a fortnight with The Viscount Who Loved Me's second epilogue. In the meantime, you can find us on Twitter and Instagram as at BridgertonPod or send us an email at BridgertonPod at gmail.com. This episode was recorded on the traditional and unceded land of the Gadigal, Wurundjeri and Bunurong people and edited by our audio producer, Rudy Bremer, on Gadigal Country. What Would Danbury Do is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts.